campaigns to get the most meaningful observations uh, to improve uh, process level understanding of the most important uh, processes. And of course, this requires a tight integration of the two approaches that would ideally start at the proposal stage of the, of the research projects. Uh, so last year, we had uh, several excellent presentations uh, spread out over two different uh, meetings that discussed biogeochemical modeling in the Arctic and the integration with observations. And uh, several speakers from there uh, that, that presented then are also on the call today, like Nicole and, and, and Georgina and Jackie. Um, and we believe that it's, it's useful to keep this discussion going. So that's why we decided to organize uh, a, a new set of meetings. Uh, so the second part of this series will be hosted by the Marine Ecosystems Collaboration Team, and it will take place next month on Monday, November 25th. And Hendrik Tolman will be talking about uh, the NOAA Unified Forecast System. Uh, so today we will have two presentations, and uh, the second one will be given by Keith Moore. We'll talk about a modeling study that they did to explore the marine biogeochemistry in the Arctic in the, in the next century. But first, we'll have a presentation by Clara Deal. Uh, she, will, um, she wrote a white paper um, about Arctic, um, or marine biogeochemistry in the coastal Arctic. And she did that for the, the DOE's RGMA program. And she, uh, last year, uh, she, invited several, she invited the community to contribute to this white paper. And uh, many of you kind of contributed and uh, provided input in this, uh, in this white paper. So she will talk about the, uh, the main uh, conclusions that she, that she uh, arrived at in this white paper. And then we will follow that up with a discussion about 15 or 20 minutes uh, to discuss how to improve the, in the integration between models um, and observations. So with that, I guess we'll hand it over to Clara. Getting the set up here. Hello, everybody. Um, can you hear me fine? <laughs> yeah, well, good afternoon and good morning, Alaska. My name is Clara Deal, and for the next 10 minutes, I'm going to talk about the Neurotic Marine Biogeochemistry in the Coastal Arctic White Paper. The long title includes the aim, which is towards improved understanding, quantitative understanding of the controls on marine biogeochemical processes in the Arctic coastal zone and their impacts on climate and the food web. Well, it was, as Welbert mentioned, it was almost exactly a year ago at the joint session of the Marine Ecosystem, ecosystem Collaboration Team and Modeling Subteam that Georgina and I presented the idea for this white paper and we invited anybody interested contributing to get a hold of me. Um, so since then, Wilbert volunteered to help lead the writing. Uh, a few people answered my call, and along with some of my IR colleagues and other people ex who expressed interest, we got 10 contributors to pro that provided a spectrum of, imp of input. I'm very grateful to that, for that. Well, though outline for the white paper that I proposed a year ago. We stayed pretty close to that outline, which I show here. The white paper starts with three grand challenges that are framed as science questions. Following comes the, our recommendations on long-term goals and short-term or near-term goals to address those um, grand challenges. We briefly mentioned some of the ongoing and planned research projects, major research projects in the coastal Arctic. Um, and then we made recommendations on some of the gaps, especially as they relate to the modeling and on uh, recommendations on research needs and opportunities. And it's followed with some uh, list, a short list of suggested readings that include a plan and report that um, we referenced that go into the science in much more detail and some other references that describe the new sampling technologies that we just mentioned in the white paper. Well, these are the three grand challenges. Number one and number three. 
basically are, well, they are, what are the key processes through which Arctic marine biogeochemistry impact the climate system and also impact the food web in response to climate change? The second grand challenge, what are the effects of ongoing and future change on the nearshore Arctic biogeochemistry? On the next three slides, I'm going to uh, take each grand challenge and then list the long-term goals, recommendations, and provide a, one example of a near-term uh, activity to alter addressing these grand challenges. So for the first grand challenge, first long-term goal is identify processes through which coastal and offshore Arctic marine biogeochemistry chemistry affects ocean heat, carbon storage, and the Earth's radiative balance. Second long-term goal is quantify the potential impacts and uncertainties of the process that identify it and rank these process according to the potential importance and their uncertainty and identify those processes having the highest PIs in youth. Then third, reduce those uncertainties and those processes that have been identified above um, with targeted investigations, combining field observations, satellite remote sensing observations, laboratory studies and modeling. And uh, in the near term, a uh, uh, action item, one of them is to identify processes based on current knowledge, like which are important and how might we determine their importance. And uh, we included a template for a table to, to do this in the appendix of the white paper. And I, I took a screenshot of that here to give you an idea. And this could be used in a, in a workshop filled out to get community input, or maybe as a living document on a Google Drive or such, but it lays out the processes, the um, priority, what the priority urgency as far as model performance criteria, and how much maturity, how much scientific knowledge we know, and then on the last column, different data sources and um, variables. So just, just a suggestion there. Uh, okay, the second grand challenge, identify the marine biogeochemical processes at the ice ocean land interfaces that are most impacted by climate change and ocean acidification. Secondly, explore the effects of land on this nearshore Arctic biochemistry improve our understanding of the physical, chemical, biological, and ecological changes associated with the sea ice and snow, um, and also explore the impact on marine biochemistry of changes in freshwater. And an action item, which I, I realize is people are starting to work on, uh, add biogeochemistry of rivers and river and input into coastal ocean models. So important action item there. Okay, for the third grand challenge, it follows the same pattern, identify processes in which Arctic marine biology chemistry affects, in this case, food web, through impacts on the timing and structure and functioning of marine food web dynamics. Rank those processes, work to reduce uh, uncertainties. And then we added, um, recommend a required, well, required level, talk about it, of what biogeochemically complexity is needed in earth system models and regional Arctic system models to deliver on some of these food web process questions and even fisheries. And the fifth one here, establish a communications network to facilitate deeper collaboration between the different modeling communities, even some, the ocean ice biogeochemistry and the ecosystem food web modeling. And within those, those working with conceptual, conceptual models or ecological forecasting models, um, emergent modeling tools, and in this way we can uh, more readily, efficiently address some of these challenges. And a near-term action item, one I pulled out was to parameterize important ecosystem processes not included explicitly in models. And um, for example, like sediment resuspension, uh, bacterial uh, grazing, and um, yeah, respiration rates and such biological rates, process rates, processes. Okay, so as far as recommendations for knowledge gaps, they fall into three categories. 
in the white paper. Uh, let's see. <laughs> okay. I thought I corrected that error. Land fast ice is one word, but anyway. Okay. Processes at the terrestrial ocean interface is one of them. Land fast ice and ocean bottom sediments, and for the most part, benthos are missing in Arctic system and Earth system models. Um, organic matter processing along the land ocean continuum is not well understood. Um, seasonality and interannual variability. Uh, physical time series measurements are are important and there are some out there that I, I use like the PML, NOAA, mooring in the Bering Sea have decades of profiles. Um, and I know Jackie Grebmeyer mentioned last year in November, um, long time, long term time series of zooplankton and benthic measurements, I believe in the Chukchi and around in that area. So and um, also winter and shoulder seasons. Once we get a better understanding of these, what's happening during these times and, and represent this in the model, we'll have a, a, a more realistic um, model of the Arctic system as a system. Um, marine ecological processes that affect over upper trophic level species. Uh, that's important parts of these models. It can be used to um, predict future conditions, um, look at mechanisms that influence species shifts. And one example of, uh, of um, measurements needed are rates of biological processes. And last November, Seth, uh, Seth Danielson at this same joint webinar, the one up the month later, um, talked about the Asgard project and the suite of um, biological process rates that they are they're looking, they're measuring, and will be, which will be key for modeling. In. Okay, so. And then uh, as far as research needs and knowledge gaps, one category there was observations and I pulled out a few examples. Um, and I, I'm, I should mention at this time too, especially these last two slides, the, the input we got from contributors were, were really, really um, filled this out nicely here. So a lot of this is echoing a lot of their contributions. Well, anyway, one is development of sea ice resilient observing platforms. Uh, second, important sources of, of uncertainty and observations. And that topic, along with the next topic, access to observational data and the Russian Arctic, we had quite the discussions I remember last year on, and actually on both of those webinars on, on those needs. And I'm not sure how far um, the community has come along, especially on the third one here. And another need are to the evaluation improvement of uh, satellite remote sensing retrievals. Okay. Mm. Well, I, <laughs> I'm sorry, I have my, let me get this. Okay, one of the paper's main recommendations is there's still, I'd say, still the need for better collaboration between modeling communities and observation communities, and to follow an integrated and iterative approach between modeling and observations from the earliest stages of research projects at best. So um, I'll leave you with the, I'll end up here with the discussion slide. And um, we hope the discussion can center around how to strengthen these interactions between the observational and modeling communities. And we realize that uh, some of us, maybe most of us actually, are observers and modelers. So, um, that we can use strengthening of the interaction between the communities. And if any of these questions resonate with you, uh, please speak up in the discussion. At this point, I'll, I'll hand this over to Wilbert. Take a break here. Thank you. Excellent, thanks, thanks so much, Clara. And thanks for putting this white paper together. I mean, it takes people like you with the, the, the breadth of experience and both the feet and the modeling and observational community to, to pull something off like this. And, and also thanks, of course, to the, everybody who has contributed to, uh, to, to helping uh, Clara put this, uh, put this together. Thanks very much. Um, so yeah, as Clara said, uh, this is kind of a list of discussion items that we came up with. Um, it's 124 now. 
Um, so I don't know if we can uh, devote two, ten minutes at this point before we hand it over to Keith. Is that a is that a good good idea? Yeah, Sounds good to me. And should I stop sharing my screen? No, 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 no. This is this is good, so that people can see the uh, okay. the discussion. I was just wondering, so we could still see the people discussing uh, whatever. Okay, that's good. <laughs> yes. So, so first, the discussion point is the is the IRP, IRPIX Marine Ecosystems Collaboration Team and and the modeling sub team. Is that a uh, a useful platform? Do, do people in the community find this valuable to to connect to other uh, marine biogeochemists? Um, and it, does anybody have any suggestions to make it more useful? Uh, so one suggestion that came up is maybe to form a self-forming team uh, that is specifically focused on marine biogeochemical modeling and um, in, uh, uh, facilitating the integration with, with observations so people that can maybe get together uh, once a month to really uh, talk about this in, in a lot more detail than we can do during our monthly, uh, monthly telecons, for instance. So I'm wondering, uh, we're wondering if people have, uh, have thoughts about this. Um, this is Patty. I guess I will uh, unmute and un, and unvideo, uh, re-video myself. So uh, this is great. Thank you, Clara, for doing the presentation. Um, all I was going to say is that uh, the famous uh, group uh, that all meets once a year um, has been quite successful at bringing sort of the physical and biogeochemical uh, modeling community and um, Clara is nodding uh, with really good goals and so and highly identified so that there have been a couple of papers and so then those get done and several of us here in this call have been involved in those model intercomparison or uh, for a specific things. Now, ice algae was one, for example, um, uh, and so on and so forth. So I think that if there were to be a self-forming team or something, what can we do to make it more useful is to set really specific doable goals. Then it becomes fun because you can actually accomplish it and you see it done. Anyhow, that's it. I'm done. Yeah, just to ch chip in on that, um, uh, last last month the modeling sub team had a, a famous uh, focused uh, webinar actually, where Andrei Poshitinsky and um, uh, also uh, talked about famous and, and and its goals and how useful it was to bring these communities together. Also, um, it, it looks like it's it's in the last uh, phase of its of its existence, and it's not quite clear if there's going to be a be a follow up. Uh, it would definitely be great if um, you're, you're nodding no. Is, do you have I, I don't know. Uh, FAMOS is uh, NSF uh, funded and it goes through several cycles and uh, Andre and Mike Steele uh, have been the leads and I have no idea whether the next phase is pending, funded, I, I don't know. Uh, but mm -hmm. it, from bringing biogeochemists uh, in physical folks together, it, it has been great. It may be possible that this lab who's in the call and Yunju who's also in the call were in the most recent uh, famous meeting, which I couldn't attend and they may know more. So this is Vislav here. Um, uh, the, my understanding is that uh, for sure Andrei Prashutinsky has retired from leading the famous project or effort. Uh, the last meeting that was held in Norway, I believe, yeah. uh, Mike Steele was supposed to put together a proposal to NSF to continue, but significantly refocus it. So I'm not sure if biogeochemistry will stay there or not. I haven't been part of that proposal, have not been contributing to it. So I would suggest contacting Mike Steele at UDAP directly to find out what's the status of it. On the other hand, uh, since I already uh, have, a, <laughs> have a voice, um, I would give an example of mosaic 
for getting the observational and modeling communities together from the very, very beginning. I don't know whether we can call something similar, but the idea is that the modeling and observational, observational communities were joined together from the very beginning, including the originating and drafting the science plan and later on the implementation plan. If we want to get really something done, like Patty was suggesting, let's, let's just get something done that is achievable. We need to get the two communities, observational community and modeling community, work together from the very beginning. That's it, I rest my case. So uh, that is one of the basis of the organization of the Arctic Colors Science Plan, which is pending in NASA still, for which uh, Maria Churchu and myself and many others were very uh, involved. And so that would be an example where we tried that. We're still trying. We just don't know when if it's going to be funded. Mm -hmm. Yeah, hey, this is Renee Tatusco from the National Weather Service. Go ahead. So I have a few comments, and I may ramble, but I'd like to um, uh, I'd like to pick up where um, Vyacheslav uh, left off. Um, I, yes, I agree. There needs to be better integration with the observational communities. I know NASA is engaged in this, but I don't see where NOAA is engaged. And if there is a desire by the research community to transition observations from research into an operational capability, there needs to be a dialogue at the very beginning with NOAA uh, regarding that transition process. Uh, within NOAA, we have uh, uh, what's, uh, you know, a um, requirements process that takes anywhere from two to five years for uh, an observational network possibly to be uh, uh, recognized as being needed. Uh, the, the fact that some of these researchers, and I'm not talking about anybody on this group, uh, but some researchers are, are obtaining grants uh, with the transitional notion of having NOAA take over their observational uh, or research capabilities is just not going to happen. So that's number one. Number two, I think this group needs to bring in or engage SEON, the Sustained Arctic Observing Network. Um, and Sandy Starkweather is the vice chair of SEON. She is with uh, the University of Colorado and also Ceres, but she's uh, affiliated with NOAA. Uh, so I think it would be well worth your effort if you haven't already done so to ensure that you are engaging SEON they have developed a roadmap that I think your work could greatly inform or be informed by. So if you have not reached out to Sandy Starkweather, I would encourage you to do so. And that's all my senior memory can remember at this point in time. Thanks very much. Excellent. Thanks. Anybody else wants to chip in on this? And this is Hai Long. Uh, I'm wondering, uh, is, there, is there a specific model targeting for the um, marine biology or chemical modeling? Like uh, E3SM or? Uh. So the reason I'm asking is that uh, I think the, uh, the atmospheric deposition uh, must be very relevant, especially for um, the nutrients and other uh, chemicals uh, deposit onto snow and ice uh, and ocean with dust. Um, I'm not sure if that component is also considered for the, the research. So you mean the interaction with the atmosphere um, and the marine biogeochemistry through uh, aerosols and things like that? Uh, yeah, but in particular, no, I'm not even talking about uh, like impurities, uh, carbon, or it's just the, the nutrients that uh, come with the dust deposition that will affect would affect BGC and ocean mm -hmm. ice BGC. So yeah, that, that's a good. Go ahead. Uh, well, that atmospheric nutrient deposition is included in some of the ESMs. 
Um, in CESM, we uh, get iron, nitrogen, phosphorus, and silicon from the atmosphere to the oceans, although mainly iron and nitrogen impact uh, the biogeochemistry. Mm -hmm. is, do, do, do you mean that is already included in CESM? Pardon? Is that already uh, part so of... So that's already in CESM and it's, you know, being incorporated into E3SM as well. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. it's already, yeah. And in, in CESM we also... Um, well, a big thing that's missing that, that Claire mentioned in her talk was the nutrient runoff from land to oceans. Um, in the simulation I'm going to show, we didn't include that at all. Currently, CESM2 uh, brings in like a climatology of river nutrients uh, from the global news model. But those are just read from a file. They're still not dynamically linked to the land, and that's, that's where we need to go. Mm -hmm. so is there a, a movement in CESM to include that somehow, or is that still on the far horizon, <clears throat> beyond the horizon? Uh, I have more hope for E3SM. <laughs> it's been on the far horizon at NCAR for 20 years. <laughs> uh, the land folks just don't seem so interested in, in working on that and incorporating it. Although from the ocean side, we, we've wanted it for a while. Um, mm -hmm. and, but there are people working on river nutrients within E3SM. Um, so I think it'll happen there first, probably. Mm -hmm. The linking. Yeah, it must be right. clear. I would like to add um, to uh, the uh, land ocean. There is the uh, LTR, uh, Beaufort Lagoon um, project that I'm part of. And uh, pretty soon we will have uh, better data um, to actually uh, feed the uh, model for those regions that are not resolved in the model in general. So what is the name of that project? LTR of um, Beaufort Lagoon. Okay. Yeah, I, I, we do mention it in the white paper. So yeah, thank okay, you. Good. For that. Yeah. So thank I wanted to I wanted to second uh, Keith's uh, recommendation that the land hydrology nutrient by geochemistry coupling to the ocean critical. And what Yvette is mentioning, this is the data set to possibly use to somehow evaluate it. But what I believe what Keith is talking about is that currently the land hydrology or routing system does not account for the signal coming all the way from upstream rivers during nutrients, temperature, whatever other uh, information, all the way to the coastline into the ocean. Mm -hmm. right. So now that we're um, on the subject of Keith, yeah. Um, why don't we um, uh, stop this discussion at this point and uh, transition to Keith's presentation. And if we have um, some time left afterwards, then we can uh, pick this discussion back up or maybe we can uh, continue it uh, a month from now uh, during the, uh, the, the second part of this, um, this, this series. Okay, so share. Uh, okay. Oops. Does everyone see that? We see you, yeah. but not the screen yet. You see me, not the screen? Uh huh. I see you. <laughs> uh, hold on. Share. There we go. Desktop, share. Hey, do you see the desktop now? Yes, we do. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about um, this is uh, a community earth system model, CESM1, climate simulation along the RCP 8.5. So this is a high-end global warming simulation. Well, that assumes just business as usual fossil fuel use. So there's very strong global warming and we'll see very big impacts on the Arctic. 
Uh, we've published two previous papers that are shown here, one in science looking mainly at the Southern Ocean and, and documenting um, uh, over, over the next few centuries a sequestration, an increasing sequestration of nutrients in the deep ocean. And we have another paper looking at oxygen and biogeochemistry in the low latitudes. And then much of what I'm going to show today comes from a, an additional paper we're working on uh, that's largely, and this Arctic work has largely been led by Weiwei Fu, one of the UCI collaborators listed here. Um, okay. So as I said, this is uh, <clears throat> a high wind, I mean a high end global warming scenario all the way out to uh, 2300. So on the left, you see the, the warming by the end of this century. And so over most of the oceans, it's a, a few degrees, but in the Arctic, you can see warming more than 10 degrees C in many places. Uh, and then on the right, you see the temperature change comparing the pre-industrial to the, um, the 2290s, so coming up on 2300. And there you can see that the polar warming is exceeding you know, 25 degrees C in terms of the annual mean temperature. Um, globally, the mean surface temperatures increase by nine, 0.6 degrees at 2300 and they're still rising. So, um, you know, roughly 10 times the global warming we've seen to date. Uh, so feel free to ask questions as we go or else I'll just kind of buzz through and then we can discuss. Um, so, you know, you have a lot of warming in the surface ocean, but you also, particularly at high northern latitudes, have big changes in the salinity. And, and so the North Atlantic deep water formation slows down. That's the red line in the top panel here from about 30 sphere drops down to five by the end of the simulation. And it's kind of leveling out at five by year 2200. Um, and then in, in terms of the hydrology in the Arctic, you have some really strong hydrological forcing of the, Ar the whole Arctic system. So in the bottom panel, the blue line is showing the river runoff to the Arctic over time. And um, I'm sure this group is familiar with, you know, we already, we have a lot of the runoff today goes into the Arctic and we have a, a, a vertical salinity gradient in the Arctic today where the sea surface uh, salinity is lower than at depth. So you have a d density increasing with depth. And what we'll see is with climate change, this, this salinity driven stratification gets much, much stronger in the Arctic. So you can see there the, the river runoff nearly doubles by 2300, but you have an even bigger increase in the, in the precipitation minus evaporation. And you see a couple of observational estimates there for the year 2000. Um, <clears throat> so lots of fresh water coming into the Arctic and that drives these changes in salinity. So in the top left, you have the, the current salinity, sea surface salinity in the Arctic. And so you can see there's these warmer salty waters over in the, the North Atlantic. Some of the lowest salinity is, um, you know, in the Russian sector over here, the Laptev Sea. <clears throat> and then you see the changes in salinity by the end of this century and by the end of the, uh, the tw and by the 2290s. And this is a theme that's going to run through this talk that is that, you know, if we're only looking at climate change to 2100, we're, we're missing much of the story, maybe most of the story um, in a lot of regions, but particularly in the Arctic. Uh, so, you know, over there's parts in by 2290s, there's a 30%, that's a percentage, 30% decline in salinity at the sea surface. Uh, where you have the big rivers coming in from Eurasia. And then on the right is a global plot of salinity. And so you can really see the salinity drop um, across the Arctic and the North Atlantic. And then at lower latitudes in the North Atlantic, you get an increase in salinity. And so this is you know, tied to the slowdown of the overturning circulation. Normally the Gulf Stream is bringing that warm salty water north and that's um, you know, getting, getting shut down here by climate change. Okay, so with all this warming, um, the bottom panel here shows the mean sea surface temperature at 2300. And so even in the central Arctic, we have mean temperatures uh, close to five degrees C. And in the top panel, you see the, the sea ice cover for um, July and January. And so in this simulation, the summertime sea ice disappears uh, shortly after 2100. 
it's, it's dropping rapidly and it's gone by 2050. But the, the more surprising thing to me was by 2200, the winter sea ice is gone. So in the middle of winter, the Arctic Ocean is not freezing during that three months of darkness. Okay, so how does this affect the biology? Um, well, currently this, you know, the heavy sea ice cover greatly reduces light reaching the oceans. And so we have a light limited system for much of the year. And so the red line here is the annual mean sea ice. You see that declining uh, rapidly over the next two centuries. Um, and, and at the same time, you see the blue line is the par entering the surface ocean and it's steadily rising as the sea ice cover declines. So you're getting a longer growing season in the Arctic. Um, and then the last line on this plot, the black line is the nitrate content in the upper 150 meters of the Arctic. And so you can see there's a drop, more than 50% drop in the nitrate in the upper ocean. And we see the same pattern for phosphate and, and the other nutrients. And that's being driven by these salinity decreases at the surface and the warming at the surface, which are, are increasing stratification, reducing the mixing of nutrients up from below. And so here you can see the top panel is showing um, potential density through time. And on the left is the Arctic and on the right is the, the high latitude North Atlantic. And so in both regions, you can see the stratification is increasing. Um, you can see the density really drops in the surface of the Arctic Ocean, where you have that freshening and that freshwater lens now kind of sitting on top of the system. And then in the bottom panel, you see nitrate concentrations also through time. And so you see this big decrease in the upper ocean, dropping to very low values um, by about 2150. Uh, and you see a similar thing is happening in the North Atlantic and those, you know, are linked to some extent because some of the nutrients in the Arctic get to the upper ocean through deep mixing in the, in the North Atlantic and then flow laterally into the Arctic. Well, by shutting off the deep mixing in the North Atlantic, you've greatly weakened that, that source of nutrients to the Arctic. And within the Arctic, you greatly increase the, the stratification. So you've also weakened the vertical exchange there as well. <clears throat> so the top panel here we saw before, it's the changes in light, nutrients, and, and sea ice. And then in the bottom panel, the black line is NPP in the Arctic, and the blue line is um, the sinking flux of carbon at 100 meters depth, so the, the export production in the Arctic, the, the export of carbon, the biological pump. And there's some interesting patterns here. If you look at the the NPP, you can see it does increase at the end of the century as the sea ice is, is disappearing. Uh, but it's a short-lived increase. And then by about 2150, uh, the NPP and the carbon export drop sharply down to this lower level and, and sort of achieve a new steady state. Um, but, but, you know, the POC export is reduced here by about 50%. And so what that is, is telling us is that the nutrient input from below is down by about 50% because, you know, over the annual cycle, those things, to, you know, generally balance over large enough spatial scales. Um, the net primary production decline is smaller. And in part, that's because of the, the shift in the phytoplankton community composition that I'm going to talk about next. Um, and you see the big decrease in upper ocean nitrate. Um, okay. So with this increasing nutrient stress in the Arctic, we get a shift in the dominant phytoplankton. And, you know, keep in mind, this is a, a pretty simple model. There's only three explicit phytoplankton groups. One of those is diazotrophs, which aren't growing in the Arctic. <laughs> so we start out in the Arctic with very much a a light limited seasonally blooming sort of diatom dominated system. But as the, the light limitation is reduced and the nutrient limitation is increasing, 
the, the increasing nutrient stress favors smaller phytoplankton over the diatoms because they're more efficient at, at taking up nutrients at low concentrations. And so right about at 2100, you see this big shift in the community composition in the Arctic, which would have, you know, if this occurred, it would have major impacts on the whole Arctic food web, obviously. Um, and then the timing of the seasonal blooms also shifts. So in the bottom panel here, we see the uh, mean seasonal cycles in, in POC export across the Arctic for the 1990s, the 2090s, and the 2290s. And so even though the ice is, is starting to, to decline by the 2100, you know, you're in rapid decline, the POC export looks pretty similar comparing the 1990s and the 2090s. But going out a little, another couple of hundred years, you have a, a, a very different picture. And the spring bloom is, you know, increasingly is shifted to earlier in the year. The magnitude is much smaller. And you have this long extended summer period now, post bloom, where the nutrients have largely been stripped out of surface waters and you have a very oligotrophic type system with, with strong dominance by the small phytoplankton uh, for much of the, the latter part of the growing season. And so this is for the whole Arctic, but we can also break it down um, regionally. So this is the PX, POC export in the different regions of the Southern Ocean. And you see a very similar pattern with the spring bloom is smaller in magnitude by 2300, you know, down more than 50% in a lot of these areas. And um, it's shifted earlier and you have sort of a prolonged lower product productivity growing season um, after this kind of initial early spring bloom. And, um, you know, one thing with the Arctic is people often talk about how, you know, it's a very hetero, heterogeneous system and, you know, it's better to look at sort of these different regions than the whole Arctic um, combined. But I guess I would just note that a lot of that heterogeneity today is coming from the seasonal sea ice dynamics, which here have been, have been removed for the system and you get uh, maybe something of a more uniform Arctic in the future because of that. Okay. So just some conclusions, we have, you know, increasing river runoff and precipitation greatly um, decreases the surface salinity with climate warming, increasing stratification and weakening the mixing of nutrients from below. The declining sea ice cover reduces light limitation and in the short term, this boosts productivity, but fairly quickly, the nutrients are getting stripped out of the surface waters due to this increasing stratification. And so in our simulation, the Arctic Ocean shifts from this diatom dominated light limited ecosystem to a more small phytoplankton dominated uh, nutrient limited system. Uh, and the processes that drive these changes are, are already underway today. We're already seeing big declines in Arctic ice cover, obviously. Um, but you know, the model results indicate that the southern, um, that we'll see the same thing in the southern ocean. It's just lagging. I think we all have this misperception that you know, the Arctic sea ice is disappearing, but the Southern Ocean is very stable. You know, the ESMs tell us that, the, you know, the Southern Ocean sea ice just lags by 50 years. Uh, but it will go too. And in this simulation, all of the, the Southern Ocean sea ice is gone by 2300 as well. I'll put up this last slide and um, maybe leave this up because it has some discussion items. So one big caveat, as I already mentioned, we didn't have the runoff of nutrients from land. And especially with this increasing stratification, you know, and we, you know, weakening the mixing up of nutrients from below, the, the runoff of nutrients from land may become even more important to the system because they come in right at the surface and, and kind of get trapped there by the salinity gradient. Uh, also, the simulation did not include active ice sheets. So the huge increase in freshwater inputs we saw here didn't include the Greenland ice sheet you know, which if polar temperatures are up 25 degrees C, you're going to have water just pouring off that ice sheet into the Arctic. And um, in general, I feel like this whole, you know, this whole um, idea of interactions between ice sheet dynamics and marine biology is, 
has been very understudied and it's the ripe area for maybe new collaborations. Um, <clears throat> and the, you know, the glacier, Glacial flows are bringing both fresh water, but also nutrients, particularly iron, into the oceans. Um, and so this shift in the community composition we see here over time today, you know, we also see looking around the globe, um, uh, just spatially today, where in regions where you have strong stratification and low nutrients, you get this domination of the community by the picoplankton, and where you have weaker stratification and high injection of nutrients like coastal upwelling zones, you know, you get the, the diatom dominated bloom community. And those two, you know, communities have a very different impact on the higher trophic levels, right? If we shift the community to small phytoplankton species, that'll add more steps in the food chain before you get to large um, copepods and fish. And so this implies that, you know, the declines in, in productivity at higher trophic levels will be even larger than what we see here at the, the base of the food chain. Um, and I'll, I'll stop there and, and we can, we can take any questions. <laughs> Excellent. Thanks, Keith. That was, uh, that was really interesting. And I'm sure there are any, that, that there are questions from the, from the community. Uh, I just have a comment. Mm -hmm. You know, Keith, when you, you did those pie shaped regions around the Arctic, mm -hmm. you know, maybe it would look, you'd see some difference if you, if you could select out different like shelf sea regions, like inner shelf and it's from the Arctic basin. Mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, you that's, that's a good that? point. Okay. So yeah, if it's possible, you might want to do that. It'd be interesting to see too. Mm -hmm. but, yeah, thanks for the um, talk. You know, another, another another point that was brought up about the deposition is, you know, in today's ocean, in today's Arctic, in the model, iron is not really limiting. But as you go forward in time, um, you know, we do see more uh, limitation even iron limitation, although nitrate is still the primary limiting nutrient. Um, but iron gets kind of lower as well in the open, in the open basins, away from the shelves. So that maybe could play a role in the future. Yes, I have a question for you. Mm -hmm. uh, since you don't have the uh, river runoff, you cannot really say anything on the shelf if they would be loser or winner uh, if you have um, uh, those climate change. Suppose that you have nutrient coming from, um, from land and you are going to have a more release of nutrient from the land because you have increase of um, uh, precipitation on land, maybe. Um, so you can conceive even that you would have uh, a gain there uh, for uh, like a little bit of uh, you know uh, discharge from the the river here along the Oregon coast. Um, now, how is that going to? Uh, in my stays also at the surface for for a while, and therefore propagated towards the shelf break, and there you will have also a winner. So, can you speak a bit on that? Um, well, I think you're right. I mean, that needs to be in there. It could change these results. I think, you know, in the Arctic today, I think the, the BGC is still dominated by ocean nutrients um, coming from below rather than the, the river nutrients. But, you know, certainly with the increase in stratification, those runoff is only going to become more important in the future. And eventually it might even be one of, you know, a dominant nutrient input to surface waters. Uh, depending on how strong that stratification gets, I guess. Yeah, I, I just, why, um, yeah, sorry. Sorry, I, oh, sorry, this is, this is Georgina. Mm -hmm. um, I just wanted to, to say under the, the HILAP project um, with Wilbert, we started doing some preliminary experiments to look at the relative impact that these river nutrients have. Um, and at the moment, just sort of doing course experiments like doubling the amount of um, DON, DOC, for mm -hmm. example, in, in the river input and 
um, prelim preliminary results are sort of showing it could, you know, potentially raise the primary production by sort of five to fifteen percent. That was looking at a sort of sea-wide scale, like the Chechi Sea, the Bering Sea, etc. Mm -hmm. um, but it so it is, but it is a notable difference. And what mm -hmm. I, I would sort of next step, I'm planning on doing some um, sort of looking on a, a smaller scale, so we can look at um, sort of. Uh, closer to the coast, how important th that uh, the, those nutrients, um, what kind of role they play. But um, we're definitely seeing some difference for sure. Mm -hmm. So this is Vislav here. Uh, in terms of stratification and the uh, you know increasing freshwater lands at the surface, mm -hmm. um, not sure how well is handled, but uh, a lot of people are talking about with the declining uh, sea ice, as you said, maybe all the way through the winter, you'll have a, a, a big wave developing and fetch and stuff like that. So that might actually counteract the, the stratification in terms of uh, wind, wind forced mixing in the vertical throughout the mix layer, whatever the mix layer depth uh, will be in the future. Yeah, I think that's a valid point. And there's not a dynamic wave model sitting in this Earth system model. <laughs> that so, type so of vertical Keith, mixing is very parameterized. Uh -huh. right. So, Keith, is this still a, a what, what version of CESM was this? Can you remind me? Uh, this is CESM1. Uh -huh. so this is the so CMIP5 simulations. Right, right. So, what do you expect for uh, CMIP6 and CESM2? What, what are the main uh, developments that, that might uh, affect your results here? in terms of, yeah. Uh, well, we do have at least the climatological nutrients, and I think maybe for DIN, we actually have a transient um, river nutrient set up for DIN, so we can look at that um, a little more. Uh -huh. uh, what I really am, am keen to do, though, with, the, you know, with CESM2 is look at the other scenarios, not just this high-end warming. Um, uh -huh. But, you know, on kind of the middling scenarios, where maybe you lose the summer sea ice, but not the winter sea ice, how, how does that affect things? Is that a real tipping point? It kind of seems to be in the model. Um, yeah, so those are the main things. And, and, and also how those more moderate scenarios affect the Southern Ocean and the, the nutrient trapping that we saw down there. I'm really keen to look at that. Um, Excellent, thanks. Well, we'll make sure you will bring you back on next year. <laughs> sure. <laughs> My pleasure. Are there any other questions for Keith or anybody else who wants to? Uh, we're just past the top of the hour, so we probably have to, to wrap up. Is there anybody else who still has to, wants to put in a, a final urgent uh, comment on <clears throat> either the discussion that we had earlier or in response to Keith's presentation? Well, I have one. <laughs> uh, you know, I think this study is really neat, but we've actually had a really hard time getting it published. And a lot of times the reviewers' comments aren't even sensical, but you just get the feeling they're uncomfortable with going so far into the future. And I think the whole community has kind of year 2100 blinders on, driven by the IPCC, but I really feel like it's time we shift to longer time scales to look at, you know, what's actually going to happen over the next few hundred years. Um, and I think it's critical that we do that. So I would just urge you all to support that and maybe spread the word. <laughs> it's amazing. Some people are really resistant to the idea of going past 2100 at all. And, uh, but if we want to know what's going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't seem like that far away anymore. <laughs> right, right. It's not even a century. It's decades. All right, thanks. I'll hand it over to uh, to Meredith. Um, Wilbur, this is Danielle. Actually, um, just real quick, uh, I, I'd love to encourage everyone who's on uh, this webinar today to um, please join us again on Monday, November 25th for part two of this conversation for uh, 2019. Um, so we'll have, as, as Wilbert mentioned, we'll have Hendrik Tolman of NOAA 
giving us an introduction to the unified forecast system and what they're trying to do to support uh, the shift from research to operations to help make uh, operational model code available to researchers so that you can build modules on their uh, modeling platform so that hopefully we can facilitate that uh, research to operations uh, once you have something that, that you've, you've proven uh, is working. Um, and I hope that we can limit the formal presentations next month to just Hendrix and then um, really allow much more time for continuing this conversation. So I appreciate the, the questions raised uh, by Clara and others and, and the discussion thus far, and I really hope you'll join us to, to continue uh, that conversation next month. Um, the other thing, I want to make a very quick opportunity for anyone on the phone who has an update that's really relevant uh, between now and the end of next month uh, in terms of deadlines and things that people should know about. If you want to let people know about those, please feel free. Um, and I want to mention that the Alaska Marine Science Symposium is happening in Anchorage at the end of January. And uh, via our website, you can put in proposals now to host workshops there. So if you'd like to get a group of people together while we're at the Alaska Marine Science Symposium to put on a workshop specific uh, to something related to this, please do, do so. So um, does anybody have anything you'd like to share? And I just put a, just put a, a chat to, with a link to our, um, this event on the website, and if you have updates, you can make comments. Well, thanks so much, everyone, for participating. Thank you to our speakers, and thanks for uh, all the folks that lended your voice to the discussion. And Wilbert, did you have anything else you wanted to say in closing? Uh, no, I don't. Um, so again, thanks everybody for participating, and Keith and Clara for presenting. That was wonderful. And looking forward to next uh, meeting a month from now. Um, Thank thanks, you. everyone. Uh, thanks. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Bye.